Uh, so yeah, my signal affiliation is uh, the, okay, I'd say in English, so it's the French procurement agency for the Ministry of Defense. Um, so Daniel uh, kind of spoiled the, like my first slides and the introduction and the motivation. Um, so what is structural encryption? So, um, so here is uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang, uh, as you know, loves music and what he likes most about writing mu uh, music is writing music. So um, he has lots of scores and uh, unfortunately, yep, um, Unfortunately, he's not that wealthy, so he needs to, uh, he only lives in a small apartment and he needs to store all these scores somewhere else. Uh, what he might want to do is to outsource all these uh, documents to a library uh, in a way that will allow you to seamlessly uh, query these uh, documents. Unfortunately, he has, um, he has enemies and uh, these enemies might spy on him and uh, try to copy or, or uh, copy his music. Uh, now, the point is that Wolfgang is kind of a cypherpunk too, and um, he, he, he might want to, okay. okay. Yeah, it's up. so he might want to encrypt his database and, um, and put this encrypted database to the library, and then he will ask some queries, it wants to uh, protect the privacy of these queries too, so it will encrypt this query, submit them to the library, and receive back some uh, result, for example, the uh, matching scores. So that's the goal of the triple encryption, as Daniel uh, explained, it's really to outsource data uh, in a secure way uh, to keep, while keeping search functionalities, and uh, it's really aimed at efficiency. So the whole uh, searchable encryption Literature tries to um, combine these three uh, like properties. So you have um, a genetic solution like for polymorphic encryption, multiple computation, and um, yeah, I don't know, okay, and objective SRAM. Uh, they achieve perfect security or almost perfect security. Yep. So yeah, they achieve perfect security and or almost perfect security. Uh, over, but they have really large overhead, either in terms of computation for FHE or in terms of communication for oblivious run. So you might want to ask um, if, yeah, sorry, uh, if we can get more efficient solutions by uh, designing ad hoc constructions. So the answer is yes, but again, as Daniel explained, um, you have to leak some information. And another really important point about um, uh, searchable encryption is uh, to understand what is the uh, security performance trade-off for your construction. Um, so you can choose a very secure construction with generic solutions, but you have will have bad performances. Um, so something you can use is to use property protective encryption, such as deterministic encryption, uh, OPE, RE. This is interesting because this is legacy compatible. It will be very efficient. Unfortunately, as you will see in uh, next talks, uh, this is not really secure in practice, at least for, for uh, really large databases. Um, so one idea that was proposed 10 years ago at CCS by uh, Kirk Miller Dow was to develop index-based searchable encryption schemes. Uh, the idea is to have a, a structured encryption of uh, the reversed index, and uh, to, to perform a search, you will, essentially the client will um, uh, send a trapdoor that will allow the server to partially decrypt this uh, structure encryption of the reverse index. Um, so what's really interesting is that it's efficient and uh, it leaks, it does leak some information. Um, for example, for search, it leaks the repetition of queries. It's called uh, the search pattern. Uh, and if you consider dynamic databases, uh, when you do updates, it might leak the, uh, the indices of updated documents or the repetition of updated keywords. And this is really important because um, this is the repetition not only among the uh, update queries, but among the all queries you ask, even the search queries. So, and, and this information, keep that in mind because uh, this is a really important point. Okay. So what kind of um, things you can infer from, from these informations? Um, uh, so there had been some uh, several attacks on su such schemes. 
And one attack that was presented at Usenix this year uh, is by Zeng et al. Um, it's called file injection attack. So the idea is to insert in the database, uh, so the adversary will insert in the database some well-crafted documents that will allow you to, um, allow him to uh, like perform binary search on, on uh, the, the queries that the, uh, the, um, the client performs. So let's take this example. We have uh, only like the, the, the number of keywords that are supported is eight, so you have keyword K1 up to K8. Um, the, um, the adversary will insert three documents. Um, the first one will include keywords K1 up to K4, the second one K1, K2, and K5, K6, and the last one we will include the, uh, the odd uh, documents. So uh, imagine that now uh, Wolfgang ask a square, ask a square, asks a query sorry, uh, that match it matches not only uh, like its own document, but also two of these uh, um, malicious documents, uh, say D1 and D3. Uh, from, from this information, the server will be able to, to figure out that the query that was asked is uh, what was on keyword uh, K3, because only K3 exactly matches D1 and D3. Um, also, it's quite uh, easy to understand that the, the, um, the adversary needs to insert essentially log K uh, documents with K, where K is the number of distinct keywords. So this is a non-adaptive uh, attack that will allow you to decrypt queries that will be uh, performed after the uh, injection. Uh, so one question might be, how could you, the kind of countermeasure could you, could you have to this kind of attack, well, the, the, the author proposed to reduce the maximum number of keywords each document can contain. Uh, they call this parameter T, it's like for threshold, and um, if you uh, adopt such kind of, of uh, countermeasure, then um, essentially the, the number of uh, documents um, turns to be linear in the number of, of uh, keywords. Yet, there is, they, they present a devastative attack, um, an adaptive one, um, um, that only uses log T documents if the adversary has prior knowledge on the database, for example, the frequency distribution. So you might ask, ask what kind of, um, like, uh, what are, how does this attack work and what makes it work? Uh, the point is that the, uh, the adversary Uh, the adversary will use the, uh, the update leakage to, to, to mount this attack. Um, the reason for that is that most searchable intrusion schemes leak if a newly inserted document uh, matches a previous search query. So uh, say that Wolfgang search for, I don't know, music and then inserts a new document in his database matching music, then the server will immediately know that this new document matches this keyword music. Um, and this, this show, I mean, this attack shows that if we want dynamic uh, searchable encryption, we need, we absolutely need searchable encryption schemes with oblivious updates. Okay, and that's actually what's for right privacy. So in, in the paper, um, I formally uh, define what a for right private scheme is. So I will not uh, get into the details, but essentially, it means that an update does not leak any information on the updated keyword. Uh, this is a really interesting point because it will also allow the client to have a nice feature which is a, a secure online build of the encrypted database. Uh, most previous schemes uh, need a set of phase where that is run locally on the client um, and, and then the, so the, the client will encrypt this database and, and then outsource it to the server. It means that essentially at some point the client has as much storing, uh, as much storage than the, the, the server, which is not the case for like really weak devices. So this is also an interesting feature. Um, there had been some um, existing scheme by uh, Stefano Vettel presented like essentially three years ago at NDSS. Um, so this scheme is based on, on Oblivious RAM. Yep. Uh, and because it's based on Oblivious RAM, it shares some uh, inefficiencies, uh, in particular, in terms of, of updates. Essentially, it needs uh, log squared n uh, operations to run updates. 
um, which is um, not only operations but also um, communication, which is like really inefficient if you do a lot of updates. Uh, and it also needs large uh, transient client storage uh, to do the shuffling thing. Uh, they, they, it's based on hierarchical ORAM and, and it's based on shuffling and so you need essentially uh, poly, uh, or, um, yeah, polynomial uh, space on the client to do this shuffling stuff. Okay. And so I'm done with motivation. So this is the point of, of Surface. It's to uh, uh, design a forward private scheme uh, that is index based uh, with really low uh, search and update overhead, and that is way simpler than previous work. Uh, so let's take an example to understand what kind of um, scheme or properties we need to, to, uh, to have in this scheme. So uh, let's say that uh, Wolfgang first uh, inserted uh, C documents matching W. Uh, and then, so, so to do this, he will have to uh, send um, essentially C tokens, we call uh, these uh, update tokens, uh, UT1 up to uh, UTC. And then um, let's, figure, let's say that he, he searches W, and to do this he will provide this, this trapdoor token, uh, we call this the search token, ST, and from ST the server will be able to find and decrypt all the UTIs. Yep, the last one. Yep. Um, also, you can generalize this, this graph by saying that essentially uh, the, uh, the, the, the client sends like the STC and from STC the, client, the server will derive all the intermediate results, as the, the STIs, and from STI it will, it will immediately find and decrypt UTI. This is just a generalization of the previous graph and uh, it will allow us to, to think more, uh, to, to have a better idea of what, what's happening. Okay, uh, now imagine that um, Wolfgang uh, inserts a new document matching W. It will again send a new update token, UTC plus one. Um, it's really important to see that this new update token will be, able, will be um, matched by a search token, which will be STC plus one. Um, and we, we, we'll have some really important properties on STC plus one to achieve forward privacy. First thing is that you, you must remember that from STC plus one, the server will be able to immediately derive uh, STC. So it's really important that from UTC plus one, the server does not, is not able to find STC plus one, otherwise it will be able to derive STC and see that this new update token matches a preview search query. Uh, so you can do this, you cannot do this operation. And also it's really important that from STC, the server cannot derive STC plus one. But because again, uh, if he can, he will immediately compute UTC plus one and he will be able to see that, again, this update token matches a previous search, uh, search query. So this operation, this, uh, the, the server cannot do. More generally, you can see that the server must not be able to compute STI plus one from STI. And, and something important, it can do the opposite compute STI from STI plus one. Okay. So how do we um, instantiate those arrows to achieve uh, the, like this forward privacy uh, property while being efficient? Uh, well, one arrow is quite easy, is how do you derive STC from, uh, sorry, UTC from uh, STC? Well, you can just use uh, a half function. Yeah, that's it. Um, we can derive a hash function that is one way, and because it's one way from uh, UTC, we'll, the server will not be able to find the corresponding STC. Uh, but like the tricky thing is how how can you instantiate the uh, STIs? Or are you or how are you going to compute them? Uh, like there is a naive uh, way to do it is to uh, compute them using uh, a pseudo random function in a country mode. Um, this is this will be uh, for secure if you send uh, every ST1 F STI from ST1 to STC to do a search query. Uh, unfortunately, if you do this, uh, the client will have to send all C tokens 
to do uh, the search, and this is really inefficient in terms of communication um, because C can be fairly large, like, I don't know, uh, a few hundred thousands, for example. Uh, and the other obvious, obvious, obvious choice, sorry, is to send only the key KW. Unfortunately, if you do this, this is not right private because the server will be able to compute all the STIs. Okay. So uh, the solution of Sophos is to use a trapdoor permutation. Um, so from the public key, the server will be uh, able to compute STI from STI plus one, just using public information. But because it doesn't know the secret key, we'll not be able to do the opposite operation. And this is uh, really important because this ensured the forward privacy property. And because the client knows the secret key, it will be able to issue new search tokens as it needs it. Okay, so uh, more formally, how are we going to, to put that in place? Well, uh, the client will store, uh, will keep some storage, local storage, um, for every keyword, it will um, store the last search token, so you can see it's kind of the, the, the head of this implicit list here. Um, when it wants to perform a search query, uh, it will just send this, this head of the list. Uh, the, client, the server will be able to derive all the other elements. And to do an update, well, it just has to insert a new element at the head of the list, and it can do this by running the, trap door, the inverse trap door permutation using the secret key, uh, compute the new head, and store it again. Okay, um, so what's about complexity? Well, the search complexity for the client is constant because it only has to send the, 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 the stored element. Uh, the server uh, complexity is also optimal because um, it has to work uh, a linear amount of time. Uh, it's linear in terms of, of um, matching results. Um, for updates, well, where, um, well, suppose that, yeah, so for every new entry, for every new keyword document pair, the client only has to compute a secret key operation, and the server only has to store uh, the, 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 the update token, so uh, we're, again, optimal here. Um, what about storage? Well, uh, that's kind of the downside of this scheme. The client has to store one token per, um, per keyword, uh, and uh, the server has to store one token per, per matching or per, per entry in the, in the database. So it's, again, for the server, it's, it's optimal. It cannot do better than this. Um, so what about the trial implementation? Uh, in practice, we would like to instantiate it using RSA and, or Rabin because these are the two trial implementations that we know are, are actually secure. Uh, unfortunately, if you want a reasonable level of security, uh, you'll need to, uh, to have rather large elements, uh, 20, 48 bits. And it means that this, the, the client have to store one RSA element per, um, per keyword. And in practice, this will be huge. So how could you uh, avoid storing all elements? Um, well, it happens that with RSA or Rabin, you can, or at least RSA, um, you can uh, do this, uh, compute STC on the fly by just knowing C. Well, you can say, okay, yeah, you can do this by just uh, iteratively apply the travel permutation, but this will be ext extremely inefficient. But it happens that with um, RSA, you can do this really efficiently in a non-iterative uh, way because uh, you can essentially compute uh, some, uh, like pre-compute some powering uh, of, um, of your, your exponent here, that's the, the formula on the bottom, uh, and it will just cost you, cost the client a single private key operation. So it's not more expensive than, uh, than, uh, than the private key operation. And it happens that uh, if you use RSA, uh, the search will be also uh, embarrassingly parsable uh, for the server because it will also be able to use a trick like this and uh, jump in the middle of the chain uh, of the ESD chain and, and, uh, and do this, uh, these, these computations in parallel. Okay. Um, so what about security? Um, we can show that uh, actually the update operation does not leak any information. Uh, so it means that we are for it private. Um, what about the search leakage? Well, again, we leak the search pardon because uh, essentially we, we, when a, um, 
a search query is, is done twice, we kind of have to repeat the, um, some part of the, 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 the search token chain. So the server will be able to, to figure it out that uh, like the same keyword was queried twice. And uh, also, um, it leaks what we call the history of W. Um, it's the, the, like the list of updates um, on keyword W uh, with a timestamp. So uh, essentially, you, you, the, the server learns when uh, this keyword has been modified in the database. So you can show all this uh, like formally, uh, yet it has to be in the random oracle model. Uh, but yeah, I, I refer to the, to the full paper uh, uh, to, to, for, for the proof. It's kind of easy, but um, it has to be done. Yep. Um, so I also wrote an, impl uh, an implementation of Surfos like in C++, and it's like evaluated on, on a desktop computer uh, with kind of like not that much RAM, and it's really important. Uh, it runs on, on uh, SSDs. So here are our results. Um, I, I run this evaluation on a database with uh, 2 million keywords, 140 million entries. Um, it represented essentially a bit more than five gigabytes of storage, of, of server storage, and a bit more than 60 megabytes of client storage. And uh, you can see that uh, essentially once, like, like so the, the, the search is, is run in parallel, and uh, the amortized cost for this search is around uh, 10 microseconds per matching entry. So uh, it's, it's as efficient as n previous non-forward secure schemes uh, running on, on, on uh, non-volatile storage. And another really interesting point is that if you uh, plot the, uh, if you compare the, 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 the evolution results between uh, like the, the, the search time uh, with or without remote procedure call, you'll see that um, uh, the, uh, the remote procedure call are actually extremely expensive compared to, uh, to uh, the actual running time of the algorithms. So um, like the, the use of uh, public key um, primitive is not expensive, actually. So what do we have in the end? Uh, we have a scheme that is provably for a private, uh, that is extremely simple, as you've seen, um, that has um, a really efficient search. It's actually uh, IO bounded and, um, well, with asymptotically efficient update, like optimal, yet there is a small caveat on this. Uh, in practice, we have really low update throughput because we have to uh, compute lots, I mean, the client has to compute lots of private key operations um, and it it means that we have an update throughput which is essentially 20 times slower than, than previous works. Um, yep, that's it. So the paper is on Aprint, and uh, uh, please look at the code and, and uh, modify it as you want. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so uh, I see uh, we already have a few questions, I hope. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, so thanks for this talk, it was really interesting. I was wondering if you could help me understand, because you said that the, the client has to store k things for the number of keywords, and then you gave some way that they can compute the secret, uh, the RSA keys on the fly without having to actually store them all. So what does the client have to store exactly? It, it has to store the, the counter C. Like, uh, we must be able to, to find the, to recompute the head of the list, and because of that, he has to, to store this, this counter C so he can recompute right away. And K counters or just one counter? No, K counter, one per okay. keyword, because you can, like, you can have different counter, like, different amount of, of data store for every keyword. Do we have any more questions? If not, I have one. Um, have you tried replacing the RSA operation with an inverse hash chain, and what would be the performance gain or penalty, except for that it's bounded in length? So what I did um, is to, so something interesting is that you can see the RSA thing as kind of computing a signature uh, on, on this uh, list, and uh, that made me think about like hash-based signatures. So actually you can have something which is kind of related and compute all the elements using a hash tree. 
Uh, and this is, this solved the efficiency problem uh, in terms of updates. Uh, but there is one we, that is inherent to all these schemes, is that um, the, the server will have to store uh, all the update tokens randomly. I mean, they are randomly spread over the, the, the database, and it means that you have very, you have no locality, and when I say this, how abundant, uh, when you have really large databases, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. 